Welcome to the Insight Meditation Community of Charlottesville, Virginia. You can find all of our program offerings and information about our Sangha at www.imeditation.org. We meet weekly on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, currently on the Zoom platform for meditation and a Dharma talk given by one of our teachers. We also meet daily at noon Eastern Time on Zoom for sitting practice. We hope you can join us. Tonight I want to talk a little bit about hope and its role in our spiritual practice. <clears throat> I, I grew up in New Jersey, um, about 20 minute, it's about a 20 minute bus ride from New York City and an area of the country that has a reputation for being a little rough, pretty cynical and somewhat corrupt. That early conditioning of this is the way the world works, <clears throat> that was installed pretty deep. My parents, they were products of extreme scarcity, each of them suffering from PTSD. As I learned as the years went by what PTSD was, etc. They saw the world as a very threatening place and they wanted their progeny to be wary. They wanted, they wanted my sister and I to be street smart. Now there's a downside of too much of that. And I guess in my case, you could say I absorbed a little bit too much cynicism. It's, it's not the middle way. But fortunately over the years, I've experienced lots of countervailing experiences. I can remember a little surprise I had. It was about 35 years ago when <clears throat> I was involved in a real estate development and um, this piece of property we were trying to rezone was coming up for um, approval of that rezoning to the uh, Al Albemarle uh, Board of Supervisors. And we were sitting with our, with our attorney who was helping uh, shepherd us through this process. And, um, um, and he was very well collect, uh, connected politically, locally and statewide. He really knew everybody. And, and so out of my background, I asked him the question. I said, well, okay, let's kind of cut to the chase. Who needs to get paid and how much? And he, kind of looked at me quizzically and he said, no, we, we don't have to pay anybody here. <laughs> I was a little bit taken aback because from where I come from, that's the way everything works. <clears throat> but I was also happy that I'd landed in a local culture that was a lot more genteel than, than where I grew up. My my own conditioned cynicism is something I continue to work with. N noticing the best that I can when it has arisen, you know, the basic practice modality, feeling it in the body, noticing what emotions have arisen with it, noticing the swirl of um, associated words and images in the mind. It's kind of interesting. Often at times, often at times it appears in the mind with the with the words, yes, but. It's like when I hear some some news that most people would think may be positive or there's some small victory for humanity. And in my mind, there's okay. Yes, but. But there's this and there's that to be concerned with. That's the phenomena of <clears throat> the arising of the cynic. And of course, sadly, though, the current state of affairs in the world is really pretty ripe to feed into that cynical conditioning, if I permit it. <clears throat> and maybe ripe is an understatement, you know, in terms of the condition of the world. And see, even that has a cynical creep in it when I think like that. 
Anyway, whenever I reflect on the way greed has interfered with the possibility of healing a collapsing environment, when I reflect on how firmly, legally, powerfully racism and economic injustice are set up to accrue more and more power and resources into the hands of the few, which ends up further crushing people of color, indigenous populations, the poor, the working caste, and now the struggling middle caste. And when I reflect on the literal in your face rise of classical fascism here at home and abroad. And when I reflect on the terrible mismanagement of COVID-19 over political concern, et cetera, et cetera. The reality of it all can be disconcerting. It feeds my inner cynic if I'm not mindful. <clears throat> so with all of this, in some paradoxical way, the, the idea of or the activity of hope has my interest. So tonight I wanted to turn over some of the elements of hope and see what we might find. It's hope is like, <clears throat> feels like the opposite of cynicism. But what do we mean by hope? And how does hope fit into a contemplative practice? What, what is skillful hope? And finally, is it even a necessary part of a spiritual practice? The dictionary lists uh, hope as both a verb and a noun. Uh, as a verb, it's as in, I hope. Means to desire with the expectation of fulfillment to desire with the expectation of fulfillment. In the same vein, the noun hope is defined as trust, reliance, a desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment. So that's your standard take on hope. It's a kind of down the middle of the fairway take, ordinary hope, commonplace hope. On first blush, you feel optimism and hope. Hope offers some reason to shoulder on. Things might actually get better. That's a possibility. <clears throat> As we like to say, there's only three things that are going to happen. Things are going to get better. They're going to stay about the same, or they're going to get a little worse on, as, from your perspective. So maybe you hope that your next foray into match.com will bring you your soulmate or, or you hope your blood tests come back okay. Or you hope the COVID vaccine works well enough for life to in some way resemble the way it was way back in 2019, you know? But it's interesting, if you probe a little deeper into ordinary hope, you see that one of its aspects is that it is often um, hooked into fear. Uh, Sultram Alion, a Tibetan Buddhist nun, she says that hopes are what we are obsessed with, what we long for. Hope and fear are closely attached to each other. We often shift back and forth between hope and fear. Is, is that true? I mean, do we shift back and forth <clears throat> between hope and fear? Does fear ride along as a close companion to hope? Let, let's um, Let's try a, just a real short reflection and see what we can see. <clears throat> so settle in, kind of bring your attention inside, take a few exaggerated breaths. Full inhale, hold it, full exhale, release fully. Say three breaths, nice and deep.
And now, what is your greatest hope? Just pick one, you may have a handful. <clears throat> what do you most yearn for? Feel, if you can, the felt sense of what it's like to feel hope. Take your time. Can hope be felt in the body? <clears throat> Are there images with it or internal words, an emotion. Is hope peaceful? Or is there any agitation or anything you might call anxiety or stress. <clears throat> okay, so let's <clears throat> put hope aside and now Consider your greatest fear. What do you most fear? And again, see if it's possible to stay with it and feel it in the body, what emotions might be connected or images or internal words. Okay. Did anyone notice whether their particular greatest hope and greatest fear were related? Maybe the, even sometimes the flip side of the same coin. I mean, you, you might hope that your partner lives a long life and at the same time, you fear losing them. Or maybe you really hope for your own robust health and fear declining health. It's the eight worldly winds the Buddha spoke about you hope for pleasure and may have some fear around pain. You want to gain at whatever you're doing and may have some fear of losing. You want praise and hope for it and maybe have some fear of blame. You want positive recognition and not humiliation. <clears throat> if we look at hope in the ordinary sense, it, it in a way leaves your well being re relying on an uncertain imagined future, which is 
really beyond your control. You're investing emotional capital, hoping for a favorite outcome. And um, there's nothing wrong about this, of course, but there is a cautionary consideration. In Buddhist terms, a situation like this, an ordinary hope is ripe for creating a seedbed of unskilled craving, fixation and attachment. It can be unhealthy in the sense that uh, attaching your sense of well-being, your personal worth, your value in the world to some desired outcome often does create a level of distress when that wished upon event either is not what you expected or fizzles out in some way or collapses completely. And the effects <clears throat> when there is a level of being wedded to the outcome range from just feeling a little deflated to sometimes a lingering depression or a crushing sense of worthlessness. <clears throat> so now th th we're at the heart of the matter, the heart of what the Buddha was trying to teach, the place where freedom or bondage is possible. Both are equally possible. <clears throat> and briefly, here's how it works. I mean, the Buddhist term is dependent origination, which essentially describes how suffering can arise and how it can end. You can see it as the wheel of a deepening distress or the wheel of freedom and ease. <clears throat> so it starts out when you get born, you get born into this world. And if you're lucky, you've got a full complement of the senses. You got six of them hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking. And every time that you see something, taste something, hear or touch something, <clears throat> that activation of the sense, whatever that sense is, comes with a feeling tone. It appears, uh, it, it, it appears as something pleasant to you or unpleasant to you or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. This is the nature of being a human, taking a human birth. <clears throat> a feeling tone arises through every sense gate as that particular sense activates itself. Okay, so far, no problema, okay? Now, <clears throat> if it is something pleasant to you, there then exists the possibility of craving to creep in. Ooh, <clears throat> I want this. I want more of this. I want to keep this. I want to keep this forever. And if this trajectory intensifies and solidifies, there's trouble ahead. As you get deeper into the wanting, it, it's, re it's really like, the analogy I often think of, it's like your, your feet and hands have become sharp, sharp clawed talons and you've sunk them deep into your prey. The prey being whatever it is you desire. Then you find yourself stuck. You're, you're clinging fast, you're attached to it. Uh, this might be okay, except that nature has a different idea. Nature has its own way. And that way is impermanence, change. Every conditioned thing, everything that arises will change, fade, dissolve, or disappear. Everything that is conditioned into existence. All material things, emotions, thoughts, sounds, sights, tastes are changing all the time, coming and going. So attaching and trying to hold fast to anything, any outcome is a fool's errand. It's like if you're trying to hold on to a thick rope, then on the other end is being pulled by a group of massive NFL linemen. 
welcome to a bad case of rope burn. It's the same way when we grab on dearly <clears throat> to something we want or an outcome that we feel like we've got to have, a hope that has kind of transformed into something else. The flip side, of course, also spells trouble, meaning that if you find something is unpleasant to you, and then you try to do everything to get rid of that unpleasantness, and if you have, and if you have little or no tolerance for unpleasantness at any level, there can be a really a continued and exhausting thrashing about to remove even the most innocuous unpleasant situations. Of course, it's all a matter of degree. Now we, we all want to be comfortable. But if this seeking comfort becomes a runaway train, um, you know what happens to runaway trains? They crash. <clears throat> so the craving and clinging to something you want or thrashing about trying to avoid every unpleasantry, that's bondage. You're stuck, you're bound to the object. And when there's stuckness, there's no flow, there's no ease, there's no creativity, there's no relaxed peace. But the Buddha's uh, positive message to us, a hopeful message, if you will, is that in the same moment that a feeling tone arises with any experience, that pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant, feeling tone, within with with the experience that that moment also offers the seed the opportunity of ease and freedom if your mindfulness is keen enough at that moment if you notice the arising of wanting or not wanting in the body and mind there's a possibility You can train yourself to simply watch nature play out. Oh, look at that. Wanting has arisen. Where do I feel it in the body? What emotions are activated? What images and internal talking are happening in conjunction with all of this? <clears throat> I mean, everything arises, flowers, and passes away. Just like the spring crocuses that in most years, it's already happening in this time in February, but not so much this year. And so if, if you can experience the repeated cycles of nature dancing through, doing its thing, you get more and more comfortable and confident in your ability to flow with nature and not struggle against it so much. And so as you practice and develop those skills of just being with, allowing, watching, you actually can avoid a, a growing number of those bondage situations and relax more into uh, a greater freedom, openness. <clears throat> a simple example, and a simp simple example I often like to consider is eating at night. And it was just two nights ago, I'm puttering around doing something. And then I find myself somehow unmindfully with the refrigerator door open. You know, I'm just standing there with what seems to be some kind of pure unadulterated wanting. I'm not even fixed on anything yet. There's just this agitation of wanting. Now, if my mindfulness kicks in, I'll pause and ask myself the question, what is happening here? What do I feel in the body? Often in those situations where I've got the pantry open, or I've got the refrigerator open, <clears throat> there is some unease or some agitation, maybe a, a, a slight edgy contractedness. You know, I can feel it in the body if I pay attention. 
well, okay, <clears throat> I can get familiar with that. And then, and then I can ask, well, what, what emotions might be riding along with this? Often there's some low level fear present or maybe some loneliness to some small degree. <clears throat> but if I'm awake to all of this, now there's an opening for choice. I can choose to just watch the constellation of wanting do its thing, rising up, activating, stirs up the mind and body, all the while kind of changing and eventually running out of gas, slowing down, disappearing. If I'm patient, stay with it long enough and have a certain level of acceptance and kindness about the whole situation. In those situations, I don't have to eat. I've just had a complete experience of watching the arising and dissolution of wanting, possibly driven by a little fear and loneliness. Of course, on the other hand, I can say, well, screw it. I'm going to have some toast, granola, yogurt, whatever. My choice. I'll buy some immediate comfort at the cost of probably a sounder night's sleep and at the cost of the deepening of the habituation to seek comfort through inappropriate, unhealthy eating. So ordinary hoping, wanting, <clears throat> can lead down that alley of craving, clinging, unskillful attachment if we're kind of unaware of what's going on. And then we can be bonded, fixed to a particular outcome and there's suffering. <clears throat> but we like to hope, don't we? It doesn't have to lead into a dark alley. It can, it can just be the energy of hope. <clears throat> That's all. Sister Clear Grace is a black teacher out of the Plum Village Zen tradition. And she talks of hope as a support. And she says this, my very existence stands on the back of hope, a hope dependent upon the complicated reality of causes, conditions, and context. I am here today partially because of the seeds of hope, of the seeds of hope for emancipation. Those before me tell of great songs sung to acquire hope, Songs like, we shall overcome, and a change is going to come. They tell of political slogans like King's, I have a dream, and Obama's, yes, we can. They tell of, they tell of poetry like Langston's, I too, or Maya's, Caged Bird. They tell of biblical passages once used to oppress, turning instead into paths of freedom, giving enslaved Africans a profound sense of hope, of overcoming in the midst of suffering. This sort of transcendent hope can be a way of relating to suffering amidst continuity and change. In this way, hope sustains life and offers a belief in the possibility of positive outcomes that can help us develop intention in the face of obstacles. <clears throat> so Sister Clear Grace here is talking about hope with a long view. It's a wholesome desire, sustaining one for the long haul it's very different than the desire or the hope that leads to getting stuck. 
many of you are probably familiar with Rebecca Solnit. She's a prolific writer and she writes a lot of, she does a lot of uplifting work. And, and she offers this long view in, in a book that's appropriately titled uh, Hope in the Dark. She says, hope locates itself in the premises that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is room to act. When you recognize uncertainty, you recognize that you may be able to influence the outcomes, you alone or in concert with a few dozen or several million others. Hope is an embrace of the unknown and knowable an alternative to the certainty of both optimists and pessimists. Optimists think it will all be fine without our involvement. Pessimists take the opposite position. Both excuse themselves from acting. It's the belief that what we do matters, even though how and when it may matter, who and what it may impact are not things we can know beforehand. And we may not, in fact, know them afterward either, but they matter all the same. And history is full of people whose influence was most powerful long after they were gone. <clears throat> She's talking about don't know mind, the long view, we can't know all the variables at play. But we certainly can play in the game, making our best guesses as, as we move along. Aya uh, Yishi, you know, she's a Tibetan teacher, a social activist nun, and she's actually a renowned singer of beautiful chants. She says this, She says this about hope, but what if we look at hope as something different from desire? What if we acknowledge that we are not enlightened yet and that hope as resilience, a long-term commitment to practice and social justice and compassion, equanimity and watering the seeds of joy and happiness in ourselves is a necessary part of the courage, the strength and endurance needed to become bodhisattvas to become awakened and to create more, a more just world. Equanimity doesn't mean apathy. It means a balanced mind that can see the bigger picture, a calm and objective mind open to different points of view. And she goes on to say this, and it's a little different, different twist. Um, it's actually related to the last part of the meditation we did this evening, and it's a longer discussion. And, um, but she goes on to say this, for someone deeply involved in meditation and concentrative states who has gone far on the path of Dharma, hope probably is not that important. When we see that wisdom and joy are our natural state, the clarity beneath our projections and our rich fundamental nature, there is no need to grasp for something good coming in the future because we are already complete. What she's saying is that we're, that, that paradoxically, <clears throat> hope is part of the construction of what you might consider a raft that supports you as you find your way home, not going anywhere, just coming home to what is your natural Buddha nature, which is always right here. It's never found over there and it always exists in the eternal now, not in the future someplace. There's no delineation of past, future or present. <clears throat> That's what she's getting at in that at some point, hope 
might be superfluous. She goes on to say, i.e. she, <clears throat> and this is kind of obvious. However, we are not always connected to that big awakened mind. So in the meantime, we need a little bit of happiness, self-care, humor, and kindness, as well as a long-term vision. Hope could be compared uh, to relative bodhicitta, the compassionate wish to liberate all beings, including yourself from suffering. That's what that means. The mind that has not yet realized emptiness or perfect compassion, but has a glimmer that such joyful natural goodness is possible. <clears throat> that mind is the relative bodhicitta. It's like the great sun on the horizon, she says, even as our heart is moved by the mess and suffering in the world, we hold both realities in our heart, the mess and the potential to awaken. Moving into ultimate bodhicitta, the realization of emptiness and the true interconnection of all that is. In that case, one can leave behind a smaller pleasures and a need for hope. One is complete, joyous, and free of duality. She goes on to say, the gap between these two bodhicittas could be months, <laughs> years, or lifetimes. So we practice generosity, morality, patience, energy, concentration, wisdom, etc., and we keep going. Because we've tasted peace and happy, peace, compassion and happiness, and we know a better world. Our better natures are possible within, and without. <clears throat> so this thing, this activity called hope, it has its purpose, it has its pitfalls. It is your discerning mindfulness that will tell you which road you're on. <clears throat> and we travel both roads from time to time. One arrives at an intensifying craving, clinging and, un and unhealthy attachment. Or it can be a hope that supports and sustains you through all the challenges of this life. As your direct experience of the great natural perfection, as it becomes more steady and matures. I'll end with my favorite chant, it's, uh, I've used it before, it's the evening chant that is used in many, many monastery, monasteries around the world. And it's probably being chanted right now. Anicca Vata Sankara Upadeva Ya Domino Upajitva Nirajante Tasum Vupasamo Suka. All conditioned things are impermanent. They arise and pass away. Understanding this deeply brings the greatest happiness, which is peace. So thank you for your attention. <clears throat>